Hey, I'm Sapphire. Wanna hear something scary? <laughs> Have you ever played the infamous one-man hide-and-seek? Or owned a toy that hosted a spirit? What about Three Kings or The Devil's Mirror? This volume is all fun and games until someone gets hurt. Stories about people who've played around with the supernatural. Stories about playtime gone wrong. Our first chapter comes from Brooklyn, who owns a very unique stuffed bear. When Brooklyn was about three years old, she was diagnosed with a very serious heart problem. The doctors were always in a panic, horrified that her death would come any day. Brooklyn would constantly overhear nurses talking about how worried they were about a little girl. She thought that they might have been talking about her, but Brooklyn's mom calmed her down and reminded her that there were lots of patients in the hospital. Though it didn't help that whenever her nurse came into her room, her eyes were red and wet like she had just been crying. It always made Brooklyn nervous. What was wrong? The night before Brooklyn was to undergo surgery, she asked her nurse, you're always crying when you come in my room. Why? The nurse froze. She slowly bent down and whispered in her ear, you, you will understand, understand when you, you see her. her. At the time, Brooklyn didn't know what that meant. The surgery was a success and Brooklyn now had a new heart. Being a young girl, she couldn't quite yet grasp the gravity of what she had gone through. It didn't even cross her mind to wonder where this new heart had come from. She was just happy to be alive and well. Before she left the hospital, her nurse gave her a small stuffed bear and told her to take good care of it. Years had passed and Brooklyn was now about eight years old. She loved to draw and would sketch cute and happy characters like Winnie the Pooh and Dora the Explorer. But one day, while she was drawing, she heard a voice. It wasn't malevolent or scary, but rather calm and peaceful. It makes me happy when you make art. It was faint, but Brooklyn knew that the voice was coming from the bear. She knew how crazy it sounded, but there was no doubt in her mind that there was a spirit living inside of it that wanted to be her friend. Her name was Rosalita, and she would talk to Brooklyn all the time and Brooklyn would talk back. The problem was that no one else could hear Rosalita. Brooklyn's parents became concerned that their daughter was always locking herself in her room and talking to herself. But Brooklyn didn't care. Rosalita had become her friend. Brooklyn continued to draw pictures for her to make her happy. And Brooklyn believes that Rosalita helped her become a better artist. Rosalita would guide Brooklyn's hand on the paper. It was like she was a part of her but Rosalita became tired of the childish drawings. You need to make real art, she said. She told Brooklyn to walk outside into the yard where she found the bones of a dead mouse. Turn it into art, Rosalita said. Bring meaning to its death. So Brooklyn took the bones and glued them on a piece of paper with Rosalita instructing her each step of the way. She hung it on her wall and to this day, it's still there. It always made her parents uncomfortable, so they would always try and take it down. But whenever they would take it down, they would get sick the next day, and Brooklyn would hang it back up. Did Rosalita have something to do with that? For the most part, Rosalita was always sweet and kind, but there was something odd that happened a few times that concerned Brooklyn. When their first family dog died suddenly, Brooklyn was heartbroken. Rosalita, however, was the opposite. Now we can spend more time together. And in the span of a few weeks, her other family member's dogs unexplainably passed away. Did Rosalita have anything to do with that? Brooklyn is now 19 years old and still speaks to the stuffed bear that hosts Rosalita's spirit. Do you remember the nurse who gave this bear to you? Yes, I do. She was my mom. She was always crying because I wasn't doing well. I was staying in the same hospital as you. Did anyone ever tell you where your new heart came from? No. You are my art. Your life brought meaning to my death. Brooklyn began to cry. Thank you so much. You're so important to me. But, Rosalita continued, on your 21st birthday, I have to go. 
What do you mean? I have to move on. Oh, why? Rosalita paused. I just have to go. And I'm bringing my heart with me. Does that mean that I'll... Rosalita didn't say another word and wouldn't answer Brooklyn whenever she brought it up again. What did Rosalita mean by that? Guess you'll find out in two years. A very special thank you to Brooklyn in Missouri for sharing your story and photos with me. Our next chapter is a creepypasta written by Perfect Circle 35. During my childhood, my family was like a drop of water in a vast river, never remaining in one location for long. We were living in a house just outside the bustling metropolis of New Vineyard, Maine. Population, 643. The day after my fifth birthday, I came down with a fever. The doctor said I had mononucleosis, which meant no rough play and more fever for at least another three weeks. It was horrible timing to be bedridden. We were in the process of packing our things to move to Pennsylvania, and most of my things were already packed away in boxes, leaving my room barren. My mother brought me ginger ale and books several times a day, and these served the function of being my primary form of entertainment for the next few weeks. Boredom always looms just around the corner. I don't exactly recall how I met Mr. Widemouth. I think it was about a week after I was diagnosed with mono. My first memory of the small creature was asking him if he had a name. He told me to call him Mr. Widemouth because his mouth was large. In fact, everything about him was large in comparison to his body. His head, his eyes, his crooked ears, but his mouth was by far the largest. You look kind of like a Furby. Furby? What's a Furby? You know, the toy. The little robot with the big ears. You can pet and feed them, almost like a real pet. Oh, you don't need one of those. They aren't the same as having a real friend. I remember Mr. Widemouth disappearing every time my mother stopped by to check in on me. I don't want your parents to see me because I'm afraid they won't let us play anymore. The third or fourth morning after I met him, he greeted me with a large smile on his face. I have a new game you can play. We have to wait until after your mother comes to check on you because she can't see us play it. It's a secret game. After my mother delivered more books and soda at the usual time, Mr. Widemouth slipped out from under the bed and tugged my hand. We have to go to the room at the end of this hallway. I objected at first, as my parents had forbidden me to leave my bed without their permission, but Mr. Widemouth persisted until I gave in. The room in question had no furniture or wallpaper. Its only distinguishing feature was a window opposite the doorway. Mr. Widemouth darted across the room and gave the window a firm push, flinging it open. He then beckoned me to look out at the ground below. We were on the second story of the house, but it was on a hill, and from this angle, the drop was farther than two stories due to the incline. I like to play pretend up here. I pretend that there's a big soft trampoline below this window, and I jump. If you pretend hard enough, you bounce back up like a feather. I want you to try. I was a five-year-old with a fever, so only a hint of skepticism darted through my thoughts as I looked down and considered the possibility. It's a long drop. I said. But that's all part of the fun. It wouldn't be fun if it was only a short drop. If it were that way, you may as well just bounce on a real trampoline. I toyed with the idea, but the realist in me prevailed. I don't know if I have enough imagination. I could get hurt. Mr. Widemouth's face contorted into a snarl, but only for a moment. If you say so, he said. He spent the rest of the day under my bed, quiet as a mouse. The following morning, Mr. Widemouth arrived holding a small box. I want to teach you how to juggle, he said. Here are some things you can use to practice. I looked in the box. It was full of knives. My parents will kill me, I shouted, horrified that Mr. Widemouth had brought knives into my room, objects that my parents would never allow me to touch. Mr. Widemouth frowned. It's fun to juggle with these. I want you to try it. I pushed the box away. Knives aren't safe to just throw in the air. Mr. Widemouth's frown deepened into a scowl. He took the box of knives and slid under my bed, remaining there the rest of the day. I began to wonder how often he was under me. I started having trouble sleeping after that. Mr. Widemouth often woke me up at night, saying he put a real trampoline under the window, a big one, one that I couldn't see in the dark. I always declined and tried to go back to sleep, but Mr. Widemouth persisted. 
Sometimes he stayed by my side until early in the morning, encouraging me to jump. He wasn't so fun to play with anymore. My mother came to me one morning and told me I had her permission to walk around outside. She thought the fresh air would be good for me, especially after being confined to my room for so long. Ecstatic, I put on my sneakers and trotted out to the back porch, yearning for the feeling of sun on my face. Mr. Widemouth was waiting for me. I have something I want you to see, he said. I must have given him a weird look because he then said, It's safe, I promise. I followed him to the beginning of a deer trail which ran through the woods behind the house. This is an important path, he explained. I've had a lot of friends about your age. When they were ready, I took them down this path to a special place. You weren't ready yet, but one day, I hope to take you there. I returned to the house, wondering what kind of place lay beyond that trail. Two weeks after I met Mr. Widemouth, the last load of our things had been packed into a moving truck. I considered telling Mr. Widemouth that I would be leaving, but even at five years old, I was beginning to suspect that perhaps the creature's intentions were not to my benefit, despite what he said otherwise. For this reason, I decided to keep my departure a secret. My father and I were in the truck at 4 a.m. I saw Mr. Widemouth's silhouette in my bedroom window. He stood motionless until the truck was about to turn onto the main road. He gave a pitiful little wave goodbye, steak knife in hand. I didn't wave back. Years later, I returned to New Vineyard. The piece of land our house stood upon was empty except for the foundation, as the house burned down a few years after my family left. Out of curiosity, I followed the trail that Mr. Widemouth had shown me. Part of me expected him to jump out from behind a tree, but I felt that Mr. Widemouth was gone, somehow tied to the house that no longer existed. The trail ended at the New Vineyard Memorial Cemetery. I noticed that many of the tombstones belong to children. You can find instructions all over the internet for countless games much like this one. And each set of instructions is always prefaced with the same warning. Do not play this game. Which makes hardcore thrill seekers even more inclined to play. Like Caitlin, who played the game with a group of friends and didn't follow all the rules. Last summer, when Caitlin was 13, her friends were wondering what they could do for fun. One of her friends suggested the One Man Hide and Seek Challenge. Caitlin was a bit hesitant. She'd heard of the game before and knew that it could potentially be dangerous. But everyone else was on board, so she reluctantly agreed. One night, they met up at a park at 8 p.m. Together, the five friends walked to a nearby abandoned house that had been empty for years. There was dirty wallpaper hanging low from the walls and bits of glass and wood covering the floor. The house had a very heavy atmosphere. Caitlin was sure her friends could sense it too, but were putting on a brave face. They stopped in what appeared to be the living room and her friend pulled out her backpack with all the supplies. Nail clippers, a piece of red thread, a sewing needle, a bag of uncooked rice, scissors, a bucket, bottles of water, salt, and of course, the doll. Caitlin couldn't even look at the doll without getting shivers. It was one of those old ones that looked like a real baby, except it only had one eye. Then they began to prepare the game. First, they cut open the doll and filled it with the rice. In most Asian cultures, uncooked rice is believed to attract spirits. Then, they each clipped a fingernail and placed it inside the doll. This step binds you to it. Next, they sew the doll back up with a red thread, which represents blood vessels. They filled the bucket with water and submerged the doll. They each turned around and counted to 10. Then they took turns stabbing the doll with the scissors, repeating, I found you, Charlotte. You're it, I three found times. You, I found you, Charlotte. By giving the doll a name, it makes the spirit stronger. And now the game had begun. Everyone bolted and split into two groups. Caitlin and one other friend ran up the stairs and found a closet to hide in, where they sat in silence for what felt like hours. It was starting to look like their suspicions were correct, and this game was just a bunch of That's when they heard very light footsteps coming up the stairs. The footsteps grew louder and louder, closer and closer, with each step accompanied by a metal scrape. The sounds stopped right outside of the closet. They covered their mouths to muffle their breathing. Caitlin felt a sharp pain on her foot. She screamed and pulled her foot back and saw the scissors sliding from side to side underneath the door. They screamed and prayed and pleaded it for it to stop. 
silence. Did that really just happen? Was that really Charlotte? Or was it one of their friends playing a prank on them? When they finally composed themselves, they opened the door. No one was there, and they didn't want to stick around long enough to see if they were wrong. They ran out of the house and back to their meeting spot at the park, where their other friends were already waiting. If they were playing a trick on them, could they have possibly run back here before them? When did you get here? A while ago. We thought we heard footsteps coming down the hallway, so we jumped out a window and ran here as fast as we could. So, you've been here the whole time? You weren't playing a prank on us? No. Why? What happened? As Caitlin and her friend explained what they had just gone through, everyone was in shock. But now that they were out of the house, they figured they were safe and the doll couldn't hurt them. Unfortunately, they were wrong. You see, there were a few rules that they had forgotten to follow. The only proper way to end the game is to pour salt water on the doll when it finds you. But Caitlin and her friends ran out of the house before they could do that. So Charlotte still thinks they're playing. And one day, she's gonna find them. You're it! <laughs> Want some Snarl swag? Head on over to our website at snarl.com. Want to see something scary live? Check out the video in the description below for more information on how you can demand your city. A very special thank you to Caitlin in England for sharing her experience with me, and I hope everyone watching is discouraged from playing this game. But if you have already tried it, let me know what happened in the comments. Again, I do not recommend you play this game, but if you do, I claim no responsibility for what happens. If you're summoning spirits and don't know exactly what you're doing, you can invite something very dangerous into your life. Like this video if it gave you the chills, and don't forget to subscribe to Snarled and our sister channels Hissy Fit and Slay Tricks. If you or anyone you know have any unique paranormal experiences, DM me on Instagram and I might feature your story. Even if it doesn't fit in with the current theme, it might fit one in the future. And I do my best to read and respond to everybody, so please be patient with me. Until next time, sweet dreams.